when did you first fall in love with entrepreneurship? Oh, um, I feel like I, I kind of fell into it <laughs> uh, more so. So I'd say my first bout of entrepreneurship really um, is through Better Shared. But before that, I was a freelance designer. So I had like a bit of an inkling into kind of yeah entrepreneurship from when I started freelancing, um, which was a good five years ago now. So yeah, through through freelance design, I'd say it's probably my first step into it. But I think it's very, very different to then founding a company. Um, but yeah, so I'd say that's my first step into it. Okay. Um, so where where did you grow up? So I've I've, I've grown up in uh, London, in South London. So I'm from Croydon. Um, and yeah, I've lived here pretty much kind of a, yeah, a big part of my life. Um, so yeah, I kind of grew up in, in South London and I have traveled to other places and stayed in other places for a while in other countries, but yeah, I'm kind of back here, back in my hometown. Um, yeah, that's where I grew up. Um, and I went to school, um, a little bit further out of London. Um, and that's, yeah, kind of where I spent, I guess, most of my school days, which yeah, just slightly out of London, not too far. Um, but just more towards Kent. So um, if anyone's here from London. <laughs> And what was a young Swakara like? Oh, young Swakara. Um, very creative. Um, I've always been in creativity in some form or the other. Um, starting my sort of, yeah, I'd say from, from kind of childhood, I was always into um, either like drawing or painting or creating something. Um, I was always that kid who was always like taking random things and creating something out of it or creating random potions as my mum would love to tell me that I did a lot. Um, and I also used to really be into drama. So there was a period where I was kind of deciding whether I wanted to go into kind of acting and that kind of that really career role or whether I wanted to pursue um kind of continuing art and then move into graphic design and yeah I chose the graphic design route yeah so um did you for example go into university knowing that you were going to study design yeah so my first instance of of understanding what graphic design was was I remember in my art class at school in GCSE art um, we had one lesson um, like every now and then with I think it was my like art teachers I guess it was like a graphic designer like her friend or someone that she knew um, who I guess was like brought in to do one lesson a week and the first thing that I knew about graphic design was kind of posters and advertising I used to love we were just we were literally drawing them at the time like there was we were not on the computer doing anything at that point and that was my first introduction to what graphic that's what I thought graphic design was that you would create posters and you would see stuff on billboards, a um, little bit different, but <laughs> that's what I thought it was. And then I went to college uh, and did graphics. And then I went to university knowing yeah, that I wanted to be a graphic designer. So yeah, that's what I studied. Uh, did you always have support from your family for what you wanted to do? Yeah, um, this is probably very similar uh, in probably in other people's families, but I remember my grandma always wanted, always wanted me to, she always talks about doing law um, and I remember it was only until I had I did a job um, for London Live which is a, a TV channel in the UK um, run by started by the Evening Standard and it was the first time that I could kind of show her my work on TV so I was like okay this is what I do this is my first show I remember I did that job and then she was a bit like oh okay I understand now I get this but I think directly from my parents yeah there's always been a support of doing something creative so yeah, I'd say just yeah, maybe the older generation you couldn't quite get it. With my granddad, I could always explain to him what it was and he understood graphic design and what I wanted to do. Um, but yeah, I think especially with my mum, she was always like really supportive of yeah, kind of whatever I wanted to do, whether it was originally going into drama or obviously then going into graphic design. So Yeah. Um, what was your first job? So my first job, so my first creative job was as a junior graphic designer um or do you mean my first job in general like my very very first... first job in general and then you know let's work our way up okay <laughs> my first job in my first job in general was working in retail um and actually before that I do remember as a kid me and my neighbor used to try and sell things to like the other neighbors in like our neighborhood we used to like knock at doors and be like oh, okay do you want to buy something so I guess there was a little 
mini entrepreneur maybe in there somewhere. Um, but yeah, my first proper job was working in TK Maxx. Uh, so clothing, like retail clothing store, essentially, that was my very first job. I was a Christmas temp, I remember. Uh, yeah, I, as soon as I turned 16, I wanted to work. So as soon as I could get a part-time job, I was like, yeah, ready yeah. to go. <laughs> um, and then after that, what was your next job? I worked in a supermarket. I uh, worked in Iceland. So um, I worked there for a good few years. And it was quite fun because at the time yeah we're kind of like 16 yeah 17 16 17 and lots of people from like my area and also my college at the same time worked there um so yeah that was my second job and then I had another part-time job in a theatre bar which was good yeah good fun as well but yeah so yeah kind of retail bar work really <laughs> cool um what, what did you learn from those jobs that's still helpful today oh I would say I mean, I learned how to hand, deal with customers, like probably customer service and understanding and just kind of getting to know different people, um, how different people operate, um, understanding the frustration of customers as well. Um, and also learning to like be like do things really quickly. I remember when I worked in the bar, like everything was like super speedy and you had to just kind of learn on the job and kind of get on with it. There wasn't really time to you know kind of take your time with things because people want their drinks so <laughs> you need to move quickly and I think with the other two retail jobs it was yeah I think just learning to handle customers and deal with customer complaints you know customers needing things and yeah just helping them with general stuff but yeah and I think yeah I guess time management as well like actually being on time to work <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay now tell us about your first creative job so my first creative job was a junior designer role. And funnily, I got this job. So initially my, well, then uh, boss, he came to my degree show and saw um, my final project. And my final project was, um, I did a couple of like, I did an app and then I did a couple of, I did three books, which are all based on um, interviews really and, and the story of these three designers. So three like quite well-known designers. And so I'd done this research, I'd done these books, and that's kind of what he saw. So his first, I remember the first time he spoke to me, he actually offered me a gallery manager job, but I was so determined to be a graphic designer. Mm -hmm. I, I literally had like no other, like, I was like, that's all I'm gonna do. I had no plan B. And I remember I said to him, like, very well, I'm a junior, I've never had a job before. Like I've just done internships and worked part-time. And I remember saying to my mom and being like, it's really nice that he's obviously said for me to come into this interview but I, re I don't really want to be a gallery manager funny enough I'm now working with art but here. um and I said I really want to work so they had a studio above their gallery like a graphic design studio and I said I've, I've been to their studio before like I'd seen I've been to their gallery before and I knew I really wanted to work in the studio so I was like I really want to ask him if he's got a position as a junior designer and she was like you know what go for it and I did and I just emailed back saying thanks so much but I really want to work as a designer. Like, do you have any junior positions? And I remember I was waiting, like anxiously, literally by my laptop being like, I can't believe I've done this. Like I've just turned down maybe my only, and obviously when you come out of uni, you're kind of just like, I need to get a job. So yeah. I was just panicking, panicking and panicking. And luckily he emailed me back saying, you know, what? it was brave you saying that, but we do have an opening for a junior designer, like come and do the interview. Um, and he said, actually, he went back and looked again at my work and he's like, okay, obviously you, you do graphic design. So it does make sense that that's the job that you want. And yeah, that's, I, I got the job. So I think anyone who's watching this and is like thinking, I'm scared to ask, like sometimes just, if you believe in something and you really, really want that thing, just sometimes ask and be brave enough to ask it. Cause I think if I never asked that, I would have gone a completely different career path. So. Yeah. yeah. And how long did you work there? I worked there for around three and a half years so yeah quite a while and I I learned quite a lot because they were a really small studio and I'm always forever grateful to um my very first boss Graham um and Ricky as well who worked there and yeah he really showed me what it was like to really what it is to like run a studio and what it is to pitch and I learned so much on that first job that yeah that I still I still use today so yeah um cool um what so what kind of stuff did you end up working on um you mentioned that you know you wanted to do design when you were a kid and then you learned that mm -hmm. graphic design wasn't what you thought it was um so what is it actually in like the context of that job? 
So my, that first job was actually working in TV branding. So basically all of the graphics that you see uh, during like TV shows, if you watch the news, like all of the, like basically when you see like the headers on the screen and all of the graphics that come up uh, and idents, which kind of run in between. So once a program is finished or a program is about to start, it will kind of like have an introduction to say the program's coming up. So that is basically TV graphics. Um, and yeah, my background was in graphic design. So I was kind of like, oh, I want to do apps. I want to do like, uh, obviously I was thinking about posters and all this kind of like more kind of advertising role. Um, and going into that, I had to kind of learn very quickly. Yeah, just learning to basically, it was just working to a different grid. So I'm used to working with grids to design posters or to design, you know, any other like leaflets or things like that. Um, but yeah, now it was working on TV and looking at how I could turn basically a grid in those graphics and then hand it over to a motion designer who would bring that to life and, and yeah, start to make that move. And I started to learn a little bit about motion as well when I was there. Um, so yeah, so it was interesting. And then the kind of like digital part came back in um, a little bit later on when there would be kind of smaller jobs that they would say, okay, if you wanna, obviously you've, you've done a few like website uh, designs and things that you can work on a few of those. So I did a few pitches for, yeah, basically a larger, uh, basically an extension of that brand. So whether, so with TV brands, normally what you're doing is you're rebranding a channel or it's a new channel. So you're looking at what that identity looks like across the channel. So from the logo to the on-screen graphics, and then they have other elements. So that was the time when digital was kind of sort of as like a separate, it was like a separate department where it was like, oh yeah, they, we have to have a website and we have to have some social stuff, but it wasn't as big as it was kind of now. And I could see that was coming. Um, so I try to still kind of be involved in that part as well. Yeah. Um, and what did you ne what what did you do next after you left? What, why did you leave that company? So I actually moved into a senior role in that company. Um, I was able, to, I guess, to progress a lot quicker because they were so small. Um, it was pretty much me, and then kind of like another creative director and our boss. Um, so I was able to kind of like move up quite quickly. And then I remember at that point, I was like, okay, I have the option now to, I feel like I can't, there isn't kind of much more I can do here. Like I've learned so much and I wanted to move out of TV because I knew that like digital was kind of the, the place to be. Um, and obviously yeah, they were a TV as a TV branding uh, studio. So I was like, okay, if I want to move into digital, I need to then move to a new company. And I thought at that point I can move to a new company or I could kind of just start to see what other companies are like. So to kind of have a moment to try like, what is it, what's it like to work for a larger company or another smaller company? Like, what do I prefer? Cause I've at that point I'd only had one graphic design job. Um, so yeah, I decided to take the risk and go freelance and yeah, just kind of see how that went. So that's how, as I said, my first, I kind of fell into entrepreneurship as I say, because I, I really did it to see what it was like to, to basically have different experiences at different companies um and yeah that kind of and then once I became freelance I was like oh I like this life and <laughs> yeah <stayed there. laughs> um so how did you find your your first clients when you started freelancing so my first client actually came from that first job so I think most people when they freelance initially um because you haven't you've kind of been building your network hopefully you're still building your network whilst you're in your first job so never burn those bridges <laughs> i always tell people because my first clients were people who had for example worked with that company initially and they'd either gone on to work for a new company or they had gone out on their own and kind of launched a new brand um, and so i was able to kind of get back in touch with them and i also let lots and lots of people know that i was going freelance so i tried to kind of put the word out there and yeah that's how i got my first my first few clients were my company's essentially old clients so yeah yeah um worst freelancing experience oh oh okay my worst freelancing experience i remember this was working with a startup who it was it was chaotic so it sounded like a fun job it was to work on this uh, magazine and so I was brought in, another freelancer was brought in, but we had basically two days to turn around a job that should have been around two weeks. It was the most intense, I think, because basically they, I remember they kept coming back into the room like every like 10 minutes being like, what's the progress, how's it going? And we got it done in that time, but it was so intense and the direction was just all over the place. We ended up kind of having to redo that magazine because they were, 
there was kind of no client management with them. So they were just kind of like saying yes to the client for like every change and then feeding that back to us. So we basically redesigned that magazine, I think around in the end, we had that two days and we came back over like two weeks and we did redesigned it probably about another four or five times. Um, and yeah, it just felt like a very pointless job in the end. And it was just chaos. Like the organize, I think the organization was just a bit chaotic. Um, and it put me off startups for a little while, but I know they're not all like that, but it, it did put me off for a little while. It's a bit like, oh, if this is yeah. what it's going to be like, sure. Um, but yeah, that was probably my worst job. Yeah. Was that, people, uh, just, <laughs> <laughs> was that um, when you just started freelancing or uh, later when, when you um, had a flow of things already? Um, I had a flow by then. So this was like a couple of years in. Um, yeah, a good couple of years in actually. So I had a flow of stuff. And yeah, before that I hadn't really had, I probably had a few, there was one client who wasn't a bad client, but it was just a mistake that happened. And we basically didn't get paid for six months and it was a very long job. So I remember, yeah, <laughs> make sure you always have your contracts in place was what I'm going to say with that one. But yeah, that wasn't a, that previous one wasn't a bad job. It was just that particular project was just chaotic. Um, yeah. So I kind of learned from that. <laughs> yeah so from um uh, from everything you've learned what would you say are the three most important things every freelancer should um know or keep track of contracts initially i say that's the biggest thing is making sure that you've got your contracts in place making sure that they are signed and you've got your kind of agreements in place before you start doing any work because the worst thing is is that you do a bunch of work and a you either don't get paid or b and I think if you some of those people do pay late, but once you've got that contract or you've got that agreement in place, you're legally covered to kind of then, you know, if you have to then take that client to court or it has to go any further, you have those that legal documentation in place. Um, I say the second thing is freelancing is all about relationships. So as much as there is a big onus on like being on social media and being present I think that is really important but it's massively important to keep up your relationship so I found that I was able to get a lot of freelance jobs because I had kept up my relationships with people that I'd met over time um, and I kind of kept yeah kept in like even if as I said even that job you know I'd never bad mouth that company I'd never that's one thing I'd always say as well like even if you've had the worst experience like maybe tell other freelancers to warn them but don't just like blast out on Twitter and like start hotting up the company because <laughs> it will it will come back on you. It will just look like people won't want to work with you because they think, well, if you have a bad experience with us, you're just going to, you know, kind of bad mouth our company to the whole world. So, yeah, that's the other thing that I'd probably say. And ooh, kind of the third thing I would probably say it's always good to have. So most freelancers try to have a, a kind of set of savings because you will have the wee ups and downs, especially at the beginning. Um, and at any point, really, is to have enough so that you you have enough saved up. So whether it means that you are kind of doing a few freelancing jobs on the side before you go full time into it. Um, so you've got enough saved so that when you do have quiet weeks or sometimes you might even have quiet months, um, you kind of have to have some money kind of sitting there rather than you, because you can't really work month to month freelancing because it doesn't necessarily always work like that. Project dates get changed, um, project lengths change, you know, things like that. So yeah, always have that kind of safety net, I'd say. Cool. And so how did um, freelancing meet with Better Shared? So I actually started to think about Better Shared when I worked at my very first company um because as i said they had a gallery downstairs and i noticed in i mean they, they had that gallery for almost like 20 years i think it was going for and in that time they literally had i think only about two people of color so i was literally like wow and you do shows pretty much every month kind of throughout the year and i was sort of seeing the progression of all of these amazing like illustrators and artists um kind of coming in doing shows getting press and I was starting to sort of see the pattern like I was seeing them on kind of big platforms I was seeing them across media but then I was like okay but where are all the black artists where are all the black creators in this like why like we're in London um like you yeah, know like, why why am I not really seeing people and I was like I know there's talent out there um and I started to do my own research I thought okay there must be a similar platform to what I wanted to create well I didn't know at the time that's what I wanted to create but 
I was kind of initially just looking for my own, really just a reflection of me, just being like, I, I'd love to see somebody who looks like me doing similar stuff or yeah, being an artist, being creative, just out there like on platforms or, or in media. And I just wasn't finding anything. I remember I found a few platforms in the US, but they were very like US related. And then I found a few more platforms like in the Caribbean, but they were kind of just like blogs that people had started and they kind of didn't really keep up. Um, and it was at that point I, I sort of said to myself, I remember saying to my um, friend, like, okay, there's, there's, there's two options I can do here. I can go and complain to like these kind of media companies and say, look, you need to diversify your roster. You need to, to basically represent you need to represent what the world actually looks like. Um, I said, or I can start something myself. And the reason why I started something myself is because I realized if I went to them and presented this and said, look, this isn't what you're doing. I didn't want it to be like a diversity week or like a diversity day or like just one little column that they would give me. And then kind of like almost like put me into a little box and be like, okay, well, we've, we've, you know, we've kind of, we've answered her question, you know, we've, we've done our bit and, and that's enough because that's, and that's what I think people have to understand that when you approach someone else with a problem that you have, that's so personal to you, they're not going to see it in the same way. Like they're not affected by it. Like for them, they're just like, well, you know, most of these media companies are owned by, you know, kind of white, uh, white, yeah, white people, white males, especially. So for them, it isn't a, 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 a personal problem. And I think that's what people have to realize is that for most people, it's not a personal problem. And when it's not personal, you just don't care as much. As much as you want to care, you will not, you know, you won't have that same emotion and drive towards it. And for me, I kept thinking and thinking about Bernard Shell and kept really, really like, yeah, it kept just coming back to me as, as a thought. And I thought, okay, I need to do something about it. And so I remember I asked my friend to help me initially start just a video series to basically show people the the amazing talent that was out there in terms of creativity. And that's basically how Better Shared started. So it started as an idea to yeah shoot this video series and kind of grew from there. So yeah. And how did you come up with the name Better Shared? So I went through, <laughs> I went through a lot of names and I came up with Better Shared because it comes from the phrase that stories are better shared. And of course for me, it was really important to make sure that when I'm talking about us, we're telling our own narrative. So it was all about storytelling. It was all about being able to kind of go to a platform or at that time it was kind of going to YouTube and seeing people who looked like you and hearing stories that you could relate to. So whether it was a similar background, whether you looked like that person, whether, you know, you came from, you grew up in the same town, like there was something that you could relate to. And so, yeah, that's where the name Better Share came from. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so today, Better Shared is this um, online art gallery, um, we can say. Um, but what, like, what stages has the idea gone through to get to where you're at now? So we started off, as I said, as a video series. And yeah. then from that, I was like, OK, I probably need like a platform or a website to put this on. So it essentially started another a website to basically just host the videos and it kind of became a blog because videos were great, but shooting videos kind of like weekly or even daily is a lot of work. Um, and I had amazing, and I will always be grateful to my very, very first team. Um, so big shout out to all of you guys, Nikisha, Joby, Ian and John, um, like those four like helped me basically bring Better Shed to life. Without them, it wouldn't be kind of have evolved into what it is now. So yeah, it kind of started as that. And then I created the website and that became a blog and I started to do written interviews. And then I started to do events um, to kind of showcase. So not just people being able to watch people um, kind of in a video series, I started to do events where you could showcase art um, and we did photography um, and people could kind of mingle and meet each other. And then from there, people then started to ask if they could buy the art or buy the photography when we were doing kind of exhibitions and we did like film screenings and things. Um, and that's where the thought really for Better Shared becoming um, this marketplace started to kind of grow. So it wasn't because Better Shared wasn't started as a business per se. Um, it got to a point where it was like, okay, it could either go kind of the charity route or it, you know, I had to look at, is there a viable business in here? And I think because the demand for, 
and basically more and more people kept asking and every time I do an event people wanted to purchase something um, I could see that the demand was there and then when I was speaking to creatives and artists in particular um, because we kind of whittled it down to just artists and photographers um, before we were kind of quite broad and I realized the areas that we were strongest at was kind of photography and art and I think most people who are running a similar platform will get to that eventually like you'll realize there is a niche that you probably need to bring it down to um, because at that point other platforms started to kind of pop up and were kind of really good with fashion or really good with film and so that was kind of our strongest area so yeah from there um, I started then to kind of sell the work at events um, and then, yeah, kind of started to change the website around and started to sell the web, the, the kind of work online and then introduce the print on demand um, service so that artists are able to, from wherever they are in the world, they're able to just uh, basically send over their digital files and start selling high quality GK prints and um, with no upfront costs. So it's print on demand. So basically the print is paid for once the buyer pays for the print. Um, and I realized this was like a really needed service, especially for artists, because the cost of print, if any artist here watching this will know, the cost of printing your own prints and then having this big stack of prints that you're trying to sell is expensive. Um, and so, yeah, I wanted to make it accessible to emerging artists who don't have the budget of a gallery or don't have the budget of an established artist to keep. And also it's just, it's just a big expense that's kind of sitting there um, and there's no wastage. So, you know, we don't print what isn't being sold. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of where the marketplace grew and yeah, and then we've now transitioned in the last year to our new site and it will kind of keep developing from there. So yeah, that's basically what we work on. And we do still do events, so we do do pop-up events still. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much how, how it evolved. Cool. Um, so how can an artist start selling through Better Shared? So we're, it's curated still. So what we have an application, if you go onto our site and we have a little link at the bottom, if you scroll down to the footer, it says sell art with us. Um, you can click on there and you can read whether you'd like to sell original art or you'd like to start selling prints. Uh, and then there's an application form where you can kind of upload a few of your things and we will get back to you to let you know whether it's been successful. And if it isn't, we tend to give you a reason. So it might be that we feel that you're not ready at that time or your collection maybe isn't big enough, um, or, your, or we do have a lot of artists whose work suits are, so we do have a few commercial jobs that come through. So we have quite a big network where brands will want to work with, um, you know, illustrators of a particular, like who have a particular style that will say, you know what, we'll, we obviously keep your details on file. And if there's any commission jobs that come up that suit your work, um, obviously we'll forward that to, to any of our um, clients. So, yeah. Pretty, yeah, pretty simple, okay. just click on the website. <laughs> All right, um, so we have uh, Better Shared um, mm -hmm. and the Artist Network. And mm -hmm. then there's also your network of um, brands and collectors who um, come to you for jobs and then you get the artists involved. Yeah. Okay. Um, so currently you have the Summer Shared collection um, yeah. up. Um, so tell us about that um, and you can tell us about past collections as well. Mm -hmm. So our Summer Shared, Shared, wow, Summer Shared collection is um, a, it's actually our first um, virtual gallery. So obviously during lockdown and Corona, we weren't able to do any pop-up events. So normally we do a pop-up event and you'll see our new collection. And it was the first time that we were able to actually create and because it, it was virtual, it was amazing to create something that really just inspired people that were kind of, it's all inspired by the colors of summer. Um, and it's really an interpretation of blackness um, throughout. We've got six artists from six different countries all in one destination. Um, so and it's everyone's kind of interpretation of, yeah, kind of their culture, their experiences. We've got everything from work from kind of Mozambique, Nigeria, Kenya, um, Dublin, uh, kind of, yeah, the UK and the US. So um, yeah, it's been amazing to kind of put that work all into one place and yeah, just have such inspiring kind of colors and um, emotions and things coming through. So any of those pieces are kind of full of color. So if you're looking for something kind of beautiful and colorful and also meaningful to put on your wall, then yeah, go check it out. Uh, the virtual gallery is gonna be up and will still continue to be up. So you can explore the space. Um, it's based on, really people taking kind of a journey to um, kind of what looks more like a beachside gallery. 
um, it's because we knew that people couldn't travel. So I wanted to basically build in that experience of, yeah, kind of summer and travel into a beautiful space and fill it with beautiful art. So yeah, it's kind of like my, one of my dream galleries, bringing it to life, but online. So yeah, go check it out. So uh, what inspires the, the collections? Do you come up with a theme and then find artists or do you um, find the artists and then create a theme around who you want to feature? So we have, so the artists are generally on our platform already or sometimes we do an open call when we're looking for a particular, yeah, kind of theme around a collection. Um, our collections are themed, so normally I come up with the themes um, sometimes they're suited to the time of the year. For example, we have our month of women, which is the entire month of March. Um, so we have International Women's Day in, at least I know in, in the UK. And I think, I think it's a different, sometimes I think it's a different day on different, in different countries, but our International Women's Day is in March. So rather than just do one day, we do an entire month uh, to celebrate women. So we generally have themes that pertain to kind of, yeah, kind of women and, um, yeah kind of women identifying artists as well during that month so we've had themes of empowerment um we've kind of partnered with um different companies as well to to bring that to life throughout the month um so yeah so, so the themes yeah the themes kind of vary throughout the year um and sometimes we also do collections that like we've got a collection coming up with Nils Nyat which I'm very excited about who is an artist uh from Belgium and yeah his work is it's, it's interesting it's it's a story about love and um yeah kind of three interesting stories so kind of a good storytelling uh series so sometimes we have individual collections with specific artists mm. that we bring to life so yeah that's our next one coming up so it's a bit of a preview for you <laughs> awesome you you had it here fast folks <laughs> um what's the what's the profile of buyers in in your network um, and is there like a specific kind of art they're usually interested in? Yeah, so what uh, generally we have people who, so every buyer has some connection to the work in some way. So I think that's what's really beautiful about Better Shared is that it's not just, okay, it looks pretty on your wall. Like, yes, it, it does, but it generally has a deeper, like, people generally have a deeper connection. So they are either have some connection, either it's linked to their heritage or it's linked to an experience they have. So they might have lived in a country in Africa at some point in their lives. So it reminds them of when they were younger. Like we've had people who said, oh, this kind of reminds them of their childhood. Or I remember we've got this beautiful piece called Shiro um, by Tobogo, who is a South African artist. And the last buyer who bought that print said that she bought it because at that moment in her life, she felt like a hero. So she's like, I felt like the Shiro that I'm looking at. So when I wake up in the morning and look at that piece every day, like it reminds me of like my achievements and kind of, yeah, really brings inspiration to her every time she looks at it. So it's beautiful to kind of hear like reviews and hear stories of people um, basically just saying how the work makes them feel. And I think that's what's different about Better Shared, that it's not just your kind of like regular home decor or just some cute art to put on your wall or to fill up a space. It's something that really, um, yeah, people really connect with on a personal level. Um, so yeah, our buyer profile is generally, we've got two really. So we've got kind of millennials who tend to buy more prints. And again, but it's all about being connected to the work. Uh, and then we have slightly older, uh, kind of between like 40 and 50, year olds who um, are generally kind of buy more originals. Um, but again, I said they both audiences have, yeah, a connection, a really, really deep connection to the piece. Um, and that's generally what leads them to buy. Yeah. Um, so how do you um, balance the freelancing versus better shared? So right now I've actually um, shifted my kind of design career and I'm working more so, uh, I've got a different set of clients, I'm working completely with creatives, which is amazing. I feel like I'm, I've, it's taken a while, like it's taken about a year to kind of make this transition, but I work, I would say about 70% better shared, 30% um, I'm a creative business consultant. So I now work with I still work on a few digital things like, you know, like consulting or producing, kind of working with 
the interior designer to bring like digital experiences to life so like the virtual gallery uh, and working with other kind of creative brands and more established creatives to bring things like the gallery to life or um to bring their kind of creative brand to life um, and then I also work with creatives on an individual level or on kind of group levels to offer strategy sessions to help them really understand their business and grow their income. Uh, and I also do talks um, and yeah, I've got some workshops and I've got a course coming up as well, which I'm really excited about to basically help creatives grow their income because everybody wants to make more money, right? <laughs> yeah, yes, we do. Yeah. Um, I feel you when you say that you've been um, slowly shifting to working with creatives more. Mm -hmm. um, I've also been kind of just shifting to kind of um, work with creatives more and also to use the Startup Grind platform to um, spotlight creative businesses uh, because I think they don't get as much attention as like tech businesses or finance mm -hmm. businesses. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, yeah, so I think it's time the creatives got some some attention yes. and, uh, <laughs> so what has running a business and freelancing taught you about self-worth um you have to believe in yourself that's the first thing you know because most people even when it comes to pitching when it comes to you running your business whether you're freelancing or you're running a startup you have to have that belief in yourself um, and even if you're going for, which is kind of what we're going to be going for next, which is fundraising, is that you have to believe in your idea because that investor or that client needs to believe in you at the same time. So if you don't have, if you don't believe it yourself, like no one else is going to invest in you. So a client is not going to feel confident enough to work with you if you're kind of still um and ahhing about your own, yeah, about your, yourself and, and, and understanding your self-worth. And it's also important when it comes to um the the big thing of everyone asking what the budget is and you know you taking on certain jobs is that you have to understand for yourself like okay how much am i worth or how much is my time worth um and being strict about that and sometimes that means saying no to jobs that you might think oh but i'm worried if i don't get another job but once you set that bar and you set that level trust me people will find that money if they want to work with you <laughs> that money will suddenly appear um even if it's like a whole couple of months later or six months later like if you're strict with that um yeah you'll kind of get what you're worth and really and i think yeah i think it's it's important for people to understand that and, and feel that confidence in it because trust me everyone else out there who is making money and and is, is doing this business is doing the same thing so don't yeah don't allow yourself to yeah basically yeah to to just not get what you you need to get really and and because everyone else is out here getting what they need to so yeah don't feel like it's just and also don't feel like the cost to you is too much because you're not the client or you're not the investor because you're you're not that audience you have to understand that when you price things you're not pricing it for yourself like you know sometimes you might be like okay i wouldn't pay that for something but you have to understand what you're offering someone and what that is going to offer them in the long run is worth the amount that you're going to charge so yeah, be confident. <laughs> yeah, with freelancing, it really comes down to pricing and mm -hmm. you can't price well if you don't believe in yourself. Um, so um, you mentioned the freelancing course. Um, what, what inspired it and what can people expect to learn from it? So the course at the moment is going to be a live four week course and it is it's basically a follow up from a workshop that I run. Um, I run a workshop which basically helps creatives turn their in real life workshops, so creative workshops into a digital one. Uh, it's a short course and um, that will be available again live uh, on the 9th of September. So check that out. But I'll be doing a four week course to help creators basically turn your creative skills into a course. So something where you can start bringing in multiple income streams and something where you can essentially bring in uh, potentially passive income. So it's basically four weeks. So you've got that accountability for that four weeks. So at the end of the four weeks, you should be you should have something that you're ready 
to kind of go with or you're ready to kind of you you've got a, an idea of a course you've got the understanding of um, how to run it and how to teach it you've also got the understanding of the technical side so actually how to kind of get it onto a platform how to start advertising it and marketing it marketing it to people because that's the big thing that people always kind of forget about um, and yeah you've kind of got that confidence where it's ready to go so that's the reason why I wanted to also host it live for four weeks um, and so it will just literally be like roughly like an hour or so kind of each week and there'll be kind of bits that you'll need to do in between so that everyone collectively who is part of that uh, live group will be able to kind of finish with something that they can yeah then start making money from so I think that's that's been the big theme that I gen tend to talk about is multiple income streams and how important they are um, even when it comes to freelancing or running a business like even within a better show we have multiple income streams and I think especially during lockdown, people have seen where their income streams have disappeared or dropped. You need to start thinking about, okay, how can I make sure I've got more or make sure that I've got some that are working for me when I'm maybe not doing commissions or when I've not got freelancing work? How can I take the skills that I already possess and yeah, basically monetize them, so yeah. Cool, um, that sounds, um, it sounds like something a lot of artists really need to learn. Um, and um so make sure you send us the info and we'll help you put word out there i will do um cool so what does your support network look like um so i've got i've joined a, an amazing group um called babes on waves so shout out to Bo. Um, i actually joined them earlier in lockdown because one thing i realized is being i'm a solo founder um, I've got an amazing group of friends and I've got friends who are also entrepreneurs um, but having a support network that you can kind of like tap into and just talk to about everything from just just running a business solo also running a business kind of being a woman running a business as well and the you know us having problems that we have that are maybe individualistic to to our gender um, and just yeah, it's just, it's been, it's been really nice just to have that support where you can talk about those particular things. Um, I've also got support, I'd definitely say for my family uh, and my friends are super supportive. Like they're really understanding because if anyone's out, out there knows like being friends with an entrepreneur, like doesn't mean that they're A, always going to be free and available to go to every event or they're missing certain things or, you know, like, especially when I've got like launches or things coming up, like they're so supportive, like even sharing, um, like this talk today like I've seen it pop up on all of their um, like instas and stuff so yeah I'm, I'm massively grateful for the friends that I have and how understanding they've been to me uh, and yeah massively thankful to yeah my family and just yeah understanding that not every meal I'm going to be able to make and um just giving me the space and yeah the flexibility and the support to basically take risks really and and yeah so yeah that's that's how I would say my so my friends my family and and also my network I'd say even in better shared like it's amazing to I, I'm obviously there to support them but the support that they give me as well is yeah is, is, is really nice so I'm really grateful to them too yeah that's awesome um support is important one of my one of my favorite podcasts is called support is sexy um and they interview women entrepreneurs okay. and they just keep saying that support is sexy and it kind of sticks <laughs> um so my my last question and then we're gonna talk to everyone else um in case there's someone here listening who can um um support you what do you need right now for for your business Whoa. So I think we're reaching the phase really now of fundraising. So if there's anyone out who's an investor, <laughs> um, that's kind of, yeah, the next step that we're looking at. Um, because I'd love to be able to, yeah, essentially grow the business, um, hire some uh, other staff full time. So at the minute I work with freelancers. Um, that's another thing that you'll know if you are kind of bootstrapping your business, like you can only kind of bootstrap for so long. Um, and bootstrapping is obviously where you uh, either invest yourself or you take any kind of revenue and it gets reinvested into the business. So, yeah, we're at the point where for me to grow the business, um, yeah, a little bit more, I'm going to need some outside investments. So, yeah, that's really what I'm looking at next. 